so yes, I'm in Rome. I'm I'm close to Rome. I live close to Rome, and yeah. um, and you see people. You have consulting rooms in Rome, or or where do you where do you see people? I see people in Rome and uh, close to Rome. I have two studios, two offices, and um, as psychologist, uh, the lockdown was. Um, we were hallowed to see people uh, face to face, but I prefer to see them online. But in the last three weeks, I start again to see them face to face, even if this lockdown unlock the online therapy for many people. You know what I mean? People. I think it's that, interesting because I think we're a long way mm. from being able to see clients or to be to see patients. Yeah. And I, I think our work is going to move substantially yeah. online. Yeah. And in all honesty, I think this is a moment when, well, for training, um, I think it's a, a sea change, really, for, cha for training. Yeah. And I think I would say in future, the greater part of my training work is going to end up online. Yeah. I think there's going to be much less face-to-face -face training from now on. I think so. I think the same. Consider that my girlfriend, um, she's a dance teacher. And dance, you know, is something that you uh, you could think that it's impossible to, to do online. But it's not true. Many people also, great dancer like Roberto Bolle, you know, did a lot of training online. Uh, actually, while we are talking, she is about to starting a intensive week of training. Um, she she will she will not teach. She will uh, have lesson. Um, and uh, in in a contemporary dance, which it. It's, it's strange, you know, and it's in a way related to our topic because uh, for many years, so many decades, we think that one thing is that thing and it, that thing could be done all in that way. Yeah. Then something happened, like yeah. World War I II. And suddenly you realize it could have been done differently. I, I mean, thinking about it now, you know, for some time I've been saying we should move our training online. Mm -hmm. Partly because I felt uh, yeah, guilty at some level about the amount of flying. You know, my carbon emission yeah. each year was in some ways ridiculously high. And I would try and do all sorts of things about it. But, you know, I was flying a lot. Mm -hmm. And... I was thinking for quite a long time, we have to stop this. This has to stop. We need to move online. We don't need to be doing this. And there was always a reason not to make the change. And now suddenly this happens and we have to make the change yeah. and it will happen. And it's, it's something that, um, you know, I've, uh, I've been thinking about. Oddly enough, we had um, an invitation today to go to Vietnam to do some teaching, mm -hmm. uh, to go to Ho Chi Minh City. And um, there was a little bit of me that was thinking, oh, that would be quite nice. That would be <laughs> quite interesting going to Vietnam. And then I thought, no, let's offer them an online course. Yeah. See if we can do it online. Is there uh, a moment in brief history, your institute, Yora and uh, Chris and Harvey, yeah. Institute, in which you had this kind of switch, and um, you started to do things in the way that you do it now uh, about your model of solution focus, or I, I don't know. I, I think I presume that is something more. It was something more gradual, but. Even in gradual process, there is sometimes a um, haha moment, you know, an insight yeah. or a switching point. Oh, my goodness. I mean, look, this is asking us to look back a long way, really. Mm. Um, 
I mean, the team, we started working together using Solution Focus in 1987. And in 1987, look, as, as you know, Solution Focus was very much an exception-based model. And the exceptions, the idea that problems didn't happen all the time, that people came with solutions, that was completely central. And the picturing or describing of the preferred future was secondary in the approach. You know, Steve DeShazer used to say that actually he asked about the preferred future only or merely to work out which exceptions were relevant. Mm. Like the word he used to use was salient. Which exceptions were salient? And so the preferred future and the picturing of it was actually a very much there in order to support the usefulness of the exceptions. Mm. And when you looked at Steve's work in the early days, um, his describing of the preferred future was very, I mean, we would call it broad brush. There wasn't much detail. There wasn't much fine detail in the descriptions. And quite why we began to do it differently, I'm not quite sure. Chris says, Chris Iveson says, that it was because he misunderstood what Steve wanted, that he thought, you know, that Steve wanted, you know, as we read Steve's work, that he wanted a much more detailed picturing of it. And so we began to invite people into much, much more detailed descriptions. And as we did that, I suppose what began to happen was the place of exceptions and the place of the preferred future, they switched place. Hmm. So suddenly the picturing of the preferred future began to appear to us much more central and much more significant. And just inviting people to describe the futures that they wanted in detail it became clear to us that just doing that itself made a difference. Itself, it was, if you like, therapeutic. It made a difference just doing it. And that was, I think, one of the big changes in our work. Obviously, the other one was moving away from Steve DeShazer's traditional starting point, which he would ask people, what brings you here? Mm -hmm. which pretty well always would take people into a problem description. It's my depression, it's my anxiety, you know, it's my drinking, whatever it was. And moving towards a more solution-focused starting. And in the end, we ended up with this question, so what are your best hopes from our talking together? Mm -hmm. And look, I can't actually remember which came first, but the two things were very connected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The way that the preferred future, the picturing of the preferred future became central and the moving away from what brings you here to, so what are your best hopes from our talking together? And um, look, one of the things that Steve writes about, and he writes about it in his third book, Clues, mm -hmm. The phrase he uses is straightening the line. He says, you know, if people want to get from A to B, it's our job to find the straightest line. And I guess at Brief, we got really, really interested in this idea of straightening the line. Mm. And obviously asking people what brings you here actually takes you on a diversion into the problem. So we thought, well, that's not a very straight line. And, of course, the whole idea of exceptions, that didn't seem very much of a straight line either, hmm. in the sense that exceptions are exceptions to the rule of the problem. So you actually have to know what the problem is in order to be able to establish the exceptions. Yeah. And so we came up with this phrase, this word, instances, little bits of the preferred future that actually are in place or people are already doing. And what we then had was a straighter line. And all of these things, they were very much interwoven. And 
I very hard for me to say when it started. Mm -hmm. Very hard for me to say that. But somewhere, but I would say between 1995, 96, 97, 98, 99, our picturing of the approach really changed radically. Really changed radically. I think I read um, in your blog that um, you maintain, I'm sorry if I misunderstood, you maintain the word uh, solution-focused brief therapy to honor it, uh, Hinsu Kimberg and uh, Sid Shazer, of course, and um, of course because there are a lot of points of connection, but um, if, I, if I remember well, you say something like, um, it's not anymore solution focused because if you talk about solution, uh, there is a problem that you have talked about before. And in fact, it's, it's very interesting because when people um, here in Italy um, approach to solution focus, brief therapy, they, um, people, I mean, uh, psychologists, therapists, they often think that it's, um, how to say, uh, an approach that developed the solution to the problem or that helped the client to describe the solution. And it's not that. It's, it's more not. to, uh, I, how can we say it, uh, to, um, I don't know, a, a preferred feature-oriented uh, brief therapy. Yeah. Look, look, Flavio, I agree with that. I mean, I think that if you wanted to do it, if you were setting up a new model now uh, and, it, you know, people did what we do, then a better name would be something like outcome-oriented therapy. Mm -hmm. Outcome-oriented, probably. But I do think that if you look at Steve DeShazer's writings, everything that we've done can be found in his writings. Mm. Much less, much less in what he actually did. Because one of the interesting things about DeShazer was what he wrote about and what he did were not the same. And so Chris Harvey and I began to get very, very interested in what he wrote about and began to think to ourselves, if you took what he wrote about seriously, what sort of model would you end up with? And I think what you'd end up with is, look, something similar to what we do now. And you're right. I mean, the, the, the word solution doesn't work for us mm -hmm. because you can't have a solution without a problem. So immediately you use the word solution, you are bringing the other side of that distinction into your thinking. If you've got a solution, you have to have a problem. And uh, we're working quite hard at some level to invite people to focus on an outcome and not to have to bring the problem in their thinking into the conversation. Uh, look, it may still be there in the shadows somewhere, yeah. in the background of the work we do. Together. In fact, I think it probably is. But in terms of the work... We're not inviting people to bring it in. And look, the name is not a good name. The mm -hmm. name is not a good name. But on the other hand, I do. I feel a huge debt of gratitude to the work of Steve DeShazer and Sue Kim Burke. Um, Steve was very much our mentor at Brief. We saw him every year, at least once every year, between 1990 and the year that he died. And um, I can see a tradition. I can mm -hmm. see a tradition, and I think I still operate within that tradition. Yeah. Whether people will continue making that decision into the future and still call it solution focused brief therapy, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. We'll see. I think that um, I literally love uh, solution focus. I love your approach. I have to confess that um, I feel lucky to um, have been trained in brief approach to solution focus. It, I, it, it completely fit with my uh, love with minimalism, with to do just with to start with um, uh, the idea to do the 
how much less is possible and yeah. then you can yes. always increase uh, and look Flavio even there I think we're honoring Steve Tuchaser yeah. you know what he was interested in was both minimalism and simplicity yeah what is the least that you need to do that's associated nonetheless with a good outcome and anything additional that you do from that point of view is actually not justifiable why would you do things yeah. that aren't necessary and so our experience of solution focus has actually been an experience of cutting things out yeah. you know in the very early days uh, chris harvey and i we worked we worked in a terribly interesting a very innovative very creative mental health clinic in london it was systemic systemically oriented and um, look it was also very very problem focused and we were trying to use these new ideas from solution focus and so every time i met a client a new client it was almost like i had to make a gear change you know i came out of this very problem focused clinic and now i was trying to step into a solution focused conversation a very different way of thinking a very different way of approaching people and in order to help me to make that shift what we began to introduce into solution focus was something we called problem free talk so we would connect with people in a context of possibility of strength of competence yeah. rather than connecting with them in their problem so rather than starting with what brings you here, we would start with, so how do you like to spend your time? And as I talked with people, you know, I'd be interested in their strengths, their skills, their competencies, their talents, their abilities, all of that, and inviting people to focus on that. Yeah. And then I would go into the work. And what we realized was, after we'd been doing that for a while, and you know, this became so embedded as our way of thinking that I didn't need to do it anymore. This is just the way I thought. That actually we realized we were doing it for ourselves rather than doing it for the client. Hmm. And the client didn't need us to do that. We could just walk into the room and ask them, so what are your best hopes from our talking together? And we could start work. Because in solution focus, you can't start work until you know until you have a starting point for the conversation that's a better way of putting it and the best hopes gives you a starting point for the conversation so in that sense we've been interested in minimalizing and making simpler mm -hmm. and just as we've changed the beginning of a session you know, we've also changed the endings you know taking a break having a team discussion, compliments, bridging the statement, tasks or homework, we've begun to realize that none of that is necessary. And if it's not necessary, the question is, do you have any justification for doing something that doesn't actually make a difference to the client? Yeah. How is working solution focus in the world, I would say? or in England, in UK, in the university. I, I mean, here, you know, in Italy, uh, today is barely unknown. Um, we must be grateful to the guys in Florence. Uh, me and my team, we're doing a lot of work to spread it around. And there are a few other people who are talking about uh, solution focus. But, uh, in the university and uh, psychology faculties or other faculties is unknown. Nobody's talked about that. And this is a problem because solution focus as um, an epistemology, um, um, a philosophy that is connected to postmodernism, to poststructuralism, which is something that, uh, at least here in Italy, is not so um sp spread that is not so so tough so yeah. so much how is yeah, your yeah. country 
Well, um, I think I, I, I think we're in transition. Oh yeah. In some ways, um, and I think that the spread of the approach is both a good thing, and it has difficulties attached to it. Mm. Um, what we're seeing, I think, is that the approach is growing predominantly in the world of public health services, public mm -hmm. services, yeah. welfare, social care, public health, mental health. And um, is spreading much less in the world of private psychotherapy. Why? I think that the model is, to some extent, inconvenient okay. for private therapists. To the extent that, look, you, you know, we we say to people when they come, we'll see you for as, you know, as long as it takes. You'll tell us when you're ready to end. And typically, we see people three, either three, four or five times. I mean, currently I'm working on the basis of potentially repeatable single consultations. Mm -hmm. So I make an appointment with someone, I see them and I say, look, if you want another consultation, just email me and we can make another time. So I'm working on that basis currently. Now, that's fine for me. But if your income depends on private psychotherapy, then it's incredibly frightening to move into a world where you see people three, four, five times. Mm. It's much more secure to, you know, have clients who come much more often than that, because then your income is much more secure. Yeah. And so I think it's actually quite frightening in that way. Now, the extent to which private psychotherapy is being led into solution focus uh, is when people are taking on part-time jobs and contracts. So people who've got their own private practice, but who may be working a doctor's surgery. And in the doctor's surgery, maybe they spend two sessions there, you know, two, more, two mornings a week. And in the surgery, they're only allowed six sessions. And suddenly they begin to think, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to do something else because I need a model that's going to work in six sessions. Or people who work in employee assistance programs, EAPs, mm -hmm. where firms buy into services to support their employees, where they're allowed, again, very often six sessions. Or people who work in university departments, supporting students and supporting members of staff. And there again, very often it's a six session model. But look, Solution Focus has actually moved quite slowly into private psychotherapy. Now, where it has expanded quickly is in the world where there's too much demand and not enough supply. Social work, yeah. mental health, no psychiatry, yeah. um, child psychiatry, more than adult really. But in those worlds, and what we're now seeing are people who are training as psychiatric nurses, for example, people who are training as social workers, people who are training as psychologists to some extent, all being exposed to solution focus yeah. on their jobs. Very often they get a half day on solution focus, maybe one lecture. And what I've noticed is that the half day or the lecture is very often given by someone who's not actually a practicing solution-focused brief therapist. Nice. So the risk is, I would say, and I, look, I don't want to be rude, but the, the lectures are given by people who actually don't understand the approach. And the version of solution focus that people are getting is in some sense is quite, a, I would say, quite a crude version. Yeah. Sometimes quite an old fashioned version of the approach. And, and so, 
you have people coming and saying, you know, I've never liked solution focus because, and then they give you a heap of reasons, yeah. all things that I would never actually do. But I would never actually do in my way. It's also, so yeah. we're seeing an expansion. But the question is whether that expansion is good for our field or not. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's also interesting that uh, in my personal experience here in Italy, um, not about solution focus, because here, as I say, are relative um, unknown, relative unknown. Um, but um, uh, more and more people, more and more clients are asking for uh, brief therapy because it's brief, you yeah. know, so um, it could be convenient for um, for the psychologist therapist's point of view, but not from the client's point of view. I think um, that's right. And I, I think it's growing here too. I mean, interestingly, in one of the, you know, um, not popular, but reasonably well-read UK newspapers, there was an article on Solution Focus on Saturday. Yeah. And um, that's unusual. That's unusual. Um, but it is beginning to happen yeah. and people are, the idea of a brief therapy, I think, is developing. And I think that actually in some senses it fits the changing culture, mm. set of ideas. Because I think that people are becoming less, the word I would use is less diffident what so well the, in the past i think there was a lot of respect yeah. for professionals oh yeah you know, the doctor told me to do this yeah. Yeah, yeah so i have to do this you know if the doctor keeps you waiting for two hours outside that was okay because the doctor's time is precious in yeah. some senses whereas i think now People are challenging that view yeah. increasingly and are increasingly challenging the idea that the doctor or the expert or the specialist is always right. Mm -hmm. And the solution focus, I think, begins to change the relationship yeah. between the, the professional and the client. And actually, in many ways, centers the client's thinking. Yeah. Uh, my thinking is important too, but it centers the client's thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways that that increasingly fits the, the spirit of the times, the zeitgeist in that sense. I think it fits yeah. that spirit of the time. So I, I do see brief therapy as having a very, oh, a, a very, very strong future actually. Yeah. It is happening and it will happen. And it will happen. We are totally, we are living in a more, I totally agree, we're living in a more, um, how to say, horizontal roles, you know, not vertical. So, uh, listen, uh, Heaven, um, coming back to practice of solution for his, um, what is your most important? challenge when you practice solution focus uh what is more challenging for you goodness i mean look i mean to say there's one um you know um is probably too complimentary to me <laughs> there are a number of things i think i struggle with each and every time i see people <laughs> um well one is just I suppose, disciplining my listening. Oh, and yeah. even after more than 30 years of doing this, I can still have thoughts when I'm working with someone that are unhelpful to the process. Hmm. And I have to absolutely notice that and discipline myself. So thoughts can come into my head that come from my old expert world 
rather than come from listening to the yeah. person I'm sitting with. And the challenge for me is absolutely to notice that and to say, gosh, interesting idea and not useful for solution focus. I'll put that aside and carry on listening. So I think that's still one challenge. And another challenge is truly trusting the process, truly trusting the process. Mm -hmm. You know, I sometimes think I meet people who arrive and who are very, nowadays I see them over, over Zoom, but who are very distressed. You know, life is very tough for them. And every now and again, I can have the thought, is this all I'm going to do? You know, I'm going to find out what they want. I'm going to invite them to describe the future that contains their best hopes. I'm going to invite them to be curious about and to notice the things that they're already doing that fit with that. Is that it? Yeah. Is that all? And I have to remind myself, I say, yup, that's what I do. It seems to work. Get on with it. Yeah. And so listening, listening to the client rather than to the expert dialogue in my head, truly trusting, trusting the model, trusting the model and trusting the client. Yeah. You know, that actually, if I can talk well enough, if I can be, if I can invite people effectively enough into describing their life in this way that people really can change themselves yeah they really can do that they can make change changes will emerge that's a better way of putting it changes will emerge in the talking if i can be i suppose effective enough in inviting them into these sorts of descriptions what do they want life that contains that best those best hopes what they're doing that fits with it and so you know even after 30 33 years of doing this i still have to work at it i still have to discipline myself in that way it's hard it's very hard i, I agree because um, i think partially because um we've been tough to be the expert and uh, it's also because probably i don't know i'm just thinking because um being solution focused it's a totally changing of mind not only in therapy yeah, but considering that uh people can find their solution considering that their solution they um their way to um, see, I, 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 I don't have the, the words to say that. Um, considering that here I'm for um, very difficult mental health problems, uh, could be enough, enough, I say, um, asking people to describe their preferred future or what is working now or what will work when they will be just one small step up it seems it's not enough you, you need no. to do some very complicated stuff uh, what is complicated is the theory is yeah. the theory um i, know. I mean what what i what's interesting for me as social focus practitioner is that you know, someone could come along and maybe they're hearing voices yeah. that bother them. You know, someone else can come along who struggles to get out of bed or to open the door or to answer the phone or all sorts of things. Or, you know, someone who is drinking more than is good for them or using drugs in a way that you know isn't helping them as they as they would see it or effectively disciplining their eating to a point that they're threatening their life by doing that 
But when you ask people to describe the life that they want, their lives are always terribly similar. Yeah. You know, sometimes it would be almost impossible to tell whether this person has come to see me because they're hearing voices or whether this person has come to see me because they're starving themselves at some level. The life that they want to build is very similar. And so from a solution focus point of view, the work's the same Yeah. from that point of view. You know, obviously, if you bring a problem-centered way of working, the work would be hugely different. You know, working with someone who's been diagnosed as anorexic and someone else who's been diagnosed as psychotic, for example, you'd be expecting to work terribly differently. Yeah. But in solution focus, you don't. You know, when again, when Steve DeShazer was asked time and time again, Steve, you know, how do you use solution focus with people who are bipolar? And he, he would always say, it's the same. It's the same. How do you use it with people who've been bereaved? Well, it's the same. How do you use it with people who've been sexually abused? It's the same. Can so the process of constructing or talking with people in such a way that the new lives that they want emerge from the talking is the same. And it doesn't really matter what people come with. That's hard to take on too. That's hard to take on board, I think. Can you resist? Um, there is this... Um... When when I came to do the the first um, training uh, at Brief, um, the last three days uh, you were the trainer, but the first day was Chris, and I remember um, at the end of the day, or probably at the end of the I don't know, let's say at the end of the day, I went to Chris and I say, so Chris, um, um, I have understood, so. Uh, please tell me if I'm right and, and and explain my theory. So solution focus work in this way because this led to that and this, you have to do that. And Chris uh, look at me and, and, and ask him, is that right? Is this the way it works? And, look, and Chris look at me and say, I don't know. <laughs> Can you resist to... Um, having a theory to uh, create a theory, because th this is actually a very interesting point, because Steve Scherzer said, um, let me size the, the theory, you know? because I, I I think that he said that because he, he wanted to say um, theory is a framework, a frame. The risk is that you uh, Re remain in that frame and that you are not able to go out from that frame when you need that. But of course you always have a theory to follow, you can't have a theory, you just can be not aware of what yeah. theory are you uh, following. So uh, what do you think about that? Is that to um, not giving an explanation? Uh, uh, look, Flavio, I... I, I... I think it's interesting. Steve, you're absolutely right. Steve, when he was asked what's the theory and solution focus, he'd respond by saying there's no theory. And so when people then would say, well, what is solution focus then? Steve would say it's a description. It's a description of a way of interacting with clients that's associated with clients changing. All right. And so it starts, in his view, as a description, and then implicitly becomes the proposition. Hmm. At Brief in Milwaukee, this is what we do. Our clients seem to change. You try it, it might change for you, it might work for your clients. Your clients might change. So he said it was a description and there was no theory. But if you read Steve's books, they're full of theory. Yeah. <laughs> they're full of theory. And um, 
you know, you could see less theory in, no, no, well, yeah, less theory in his first two solution focus book, Keys and Clues. But when he moves on to putting difference to work, you begin to see much more theory coming into it. And when then you read his fourth solution focus book, his fifth book, Words Were Originally Magic, Fantastic. it's a very difficult book. And it's a very difficult book, which I've read a number of times. Don't find it easy. I still don't. And it's difficult because the theory is difficult. And he's moved into a world of Wittgensteinian philosophy, of language games, of social constructionism, all of that. And it's not easy stuff. But the question I have is, do you need to know all that stuff in order to be a really effective solution focused practitioner? And my view is you don't. I don't think you need to know anything about Wittgenstein. I don't think you need to know anything about Derrida and social constructionism and all of that in order to be a really effective solution focused practitioner. So the way I would see it is the theory is, as it were, a bolt-on, something you add on to the model, but is not necessary. Now, I also think that it's virtually impossible for people to have no theory. Yeah. I just think we're human beings. We generate little theories of some sort or another. And I think current in the solution focus there are a number of different little theories yeah and the little theory you have actually influences the way you use the approach so some people have stayed quite quite close to Duchesne's initial thinking which was essentially strategic that you know if you want to put it in its simplest that behavior is patterned the problems are uh, uh, live within patterns of behavior, that if you change the pattern, as soon as you change the pattern, you have the possibility of other things changing. Mm. There's a terribly simple, minimal little theory, something about the patterning of behavior, if you like. And then other people, I think, move to more of a sort of narrative, sort of idea about what's going on that as human beings we story our experiences we construct narratives and the narrative i construct out of the raw material of my lived life isn't just a description but at some level it becomes something of a prescription yeah. in terms of what's possible so the way i construct my narrative is both a way of understanding what's going on, but very much influences the future. And you hear lots of people who actually, when you ask them to talk about their ideas about change, they come up with something that in essence yeah. is narrative at its heart. And I think there are a number of others. You know, There are other people who will tell me, this solution focused stuff, it's all about self-esteem, isn't it? Maybe, perhaps. Yeah. Maybe it is for you. Yeah. Actually, it isn't for me, but uh, maybe it is for you. And if you have that idea, it's about self-esteem, then actually it's going to influence the questions you ask and how you ask them. You're actually going to listen differently. You're going to listen to your different client differently. So I think that it's absolutely inevitable that we're going to have theories. I think human beings are theorizers. That's what we do. And I think it's quite useful to be aware of your theory, you know, so yeah. that you're not unknowingly theorizing yeah. in your work. Mm -hmm. So you need to be aware of it. And I would say that you need to hold it lightly rather than over believing in it. It's just an idea. Yeah. It's just one way of explaining things. Who knows if it's true yeah. at that level? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. not. Some context is useful and some it's not. But everyone, I, I don't believe anyone who says they have no theory of change. I don't believe it. It's impossible. That's a theory, probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
um, listen, usually my interviews last uh, 30 minutes. We are at minute oh my goodness, 45. We but it's okay, it's okay. And I have the last question because it's the question I always ask at the end of the interview. So I wanted to continue for other 45 minutes, but it's impossible. Maybe another interview, part two. So my last question is, um, Suppose that tomorrow, no, suppose, oh yes, suppose that tomorrow <laughs> you will see a, a therapist and um, you want to um, give him or her a suggestion to uh, an exercise that he or she can practice in his um, common day life to improve a skill that uh, they can use uh, during their work with clients um, well, what will be the skill what will be the exercise you will suggest them okay um i mean obviously there are potentially a number but One that I think is worth practicing is an exercise that would help us to learn how to stay very, very close to the client's position. Mm. And so we could ask the person a question. And they could say, you know, what are your best hopes for talking together? And they answer. And every question we ask needs to take account of the client's last answer so it needs to build on the client's last answer oh. so if the person says i'd be happier you know you'd say so how do you know that you are happier well you know maybe i'd have a little bit more energy and i'd like myself more And if you found that you were to have a little bit more energy and you liked yourself more, what difference would that make? Yeah. Well, you know, I'd probably I'd do more and I'd get more done. You know, at the moment, I so hard to get stuff done. And if you found that you were able to get stuff done, what would particularly please? And on you go. So just always building your questions yeah. on something that the client has just said. I think that the core skills of solution focus are conversational skills and a core element of conversation is listening and building on what people have just said. And I think that's a really, really useful, just little skill to practice. You could do it with a colleague. Yeah. So you can ask your colleague a question and you go 10 minutes mm -hmm. one way and then you reverse roles and do 10 minutes the other way. I love it. All that. the time, building, building, building and trying not to put any words in that aren't necessary for the question. So you're working with the client's words yeah. all the time, apart from the ones that are necessary for your question. And if you were happier and more confident, of course you put in, and if you were, but the happier and more confident comes from the client. So just practicing staying really, really, really close. I, yeah. I so love that. That's an idea. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's something that I, um, I love it and I probably will suggest to my students because it's something that you can practice a whole thing in your everyday life. Okay, uh, Evan, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this interview. Um, I hope to see you soon and uh, in person, of course. And uh, please say hello to Chris and Harvey. And I will. And uh, let, let me just say that yeah. it is a huge pleasure to me to see Solution Focus appearing in Italy. Yeah. Because um, I know you know that um, my mother's family was from Italy. And um, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. And I've had family members who talk to me about therapy and, you know, they have no idea of Solution Focus in Italy. And it is just lovely to see 
la terapia centrata sulla soluzione, turning up yeah. in Italy. I, I love it. I love that. And so I'm very, very happy to talk about that. I think it will spread um, very quick. Um, I hope to have you here in Italy, you, Chris and Harvey, soon to take some classes. Uh, yeah, to... uh, one day, one day. Yeah, yeah, of course. When we're allowed out. When we're allowed out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Heaven. Bye, Have a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Bye. Bye.